As I said, uh, I'm the founder of Humans in the Loop. We are a social enterprise being the work, building the workforce of the future. Uh, and we're specifically focused on AI. So may, maybe some of you know that uh, computer vision specifically um, requires a ton of labeled data that has to be labeled manually. So we're using that as an opportunity to provide work uh, to people who are vulnerable and in vulnerable conditions. So this consists of very simple tasks like collecting data sets, categorizing them, annotating them, but it's being applied right now by some of the most innovative industries in the fields of self-driving cars and drones and satellites and facial recognition and so on. So basically, we train people to provide um, manual annotation and to really specialize in learning how to train artificial intelligence, how not to ingrain biases in it, how to uh, precisely show it, uh, how to interpret the data like a human would interpret it. Um, we have been operational for two years. We are currently employing 200 people across Bulgaria, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. And uh, we are really happy uh, to be able to provide them with dignified wages, trainings, and other opportunities. Um, currently, uh, we um, have we have been working with uh, around 50 clients across um, the AI sector in Western Europe and the US. Uh, we have raised $100,000 in non-equity funding, and we're currently self-sustaining, profitable. Um, our lifetime revenues are uh, close to $300,000, and this year only during the first quarter, they were $90,000. Um, so we're very happy that uh, we're slowly and steadily growing, we're helping people, and we're building the future job that is going to be called a human in the loop, a human who works together with AI in order to show it how to think and to feel like a human. Thank you, Iva. That's right on two minutes. Perfect. Great. I will ask the panel. Um, Adriel, Marissa, or Brian, do, do either of you have a question for Eva? How do you think about the... Uh, so I'm assuming a lot of these humans in the loop are going to be initially helping build these data sets. How do you think about uh, over time when these companies no longer really need to utilize them? <laughs> Um, so we're advancing in our work as AI advances. So right now AI is kind of, for example, in computer vision, it's kind of beyond object detection um, and image recognition, but it's still uh, requiring some human input for more complicated tasks like interpreting more complicated um, scenes or video interpretation and so on. In the future, that's going to be easy work for AI, but hopefully our humans will be able to teach even more difficult tasks like the relationships between objects in an image, interpreting the intention of the actors in them and so on, or even more complicated things. So as the advances, we're just going to be able to teach it more and more difficult things, if that makes sense. You can either jump into feedback or Marissa, if you had a question, we can have yours be the second question. I think, you know, kind of building off of that, and I guess I'm still curious about what you see as your competitive moat in the long term. I see companies like Mechanical Turk, um, you know, could easily replicate this. So how are you differentiating in the market? Um, yeah, Mechanical Turk is definitely one of the, our biggest competitors, especially in the US. Uh, but a lot of our companies are saying that the quality and the consistency of responses is um, really, really different. Um, so right now what we're focusing on is actually preparing people to understand what they're doing because crowd workers um, or micro workers usually just click on pictures um, and they do not understand the purpose of uh, what they're doing. So we're trying to train people, okay, how do you avoid biases? How does the machine learning model interpret or learn from what you show it? Show it? Um, how do you validate the output? of the model, um, how do you handle difficult cases for it? So we're really focusing on that interaction between the machine learning uh, model and the human. We're plugging in our humans after the model has been trained so that they can keep correcting its mistakes. So we're focusing on the entire workflow and we're using a lot of different tools in order to make sure that companies can use this human workforce at any point during the whole model development. Great, thank you, Eva. Uh, we did just have some questions coming in um, from the audience, but we'll just take those off privately um, and Eva can answer those, answer your question directly there, William. Um, yeah, let's Eva, move. I'll slap you, Eva, the questions, and then what we'll do is I can actually add the answers in so that everyone watching can see them. We'll jump into feedback now. I, um, I'm happy to kick it off. So sure. uh, when, when we first uh, 
got introduced to you. Um, I was really excited about it. Um, and the reason is because we have, we run an AI practice venture out. So we see tons of companies in the AI space. Um, and whether it's, you know, uh, a, a company that we work with that actually this challenge is a big piece of what actually led to uh, multiple startups that I know failing in the AI space. And the reason is because um, I think companies work towards sprinting to that 93% AI accuracy rate that's needed for users to actually have an independent AI experience that feels like they're talking to a human. Um, and, it, and, and everyone underestimates how long it takes to get there, including Dennis Mortensen, you know, one of the most successful New York City entrepreneurs who runs X.AI, who had a huge challenge when it took them longer to go to market. And so, you know, the new method for companies in that space uh, is to have AI trainers that are actually the, you know, sort of decision between what the AI recommends and uh, and what the customer actually sees until they've hit that accuracy point and so to build a platform that actually en enables startups to not have to develop that expertise internally is uh an unbelievable value for companies in that space to be able to outsource that and also to be able to uh as a startup yourself sort of teach them what that process is supposed to be um i think that you know there the question from adriel points to a good point which is eventually companies are going to get off uh, and not have to use it. But I think that there is a lot of hay that you can make in between when they get off the ground and get started and when they get to a point that they can actually, their accuracy rate is independently high enough. Um, but also whenever they're developing a new feature within AI, they need to bring the AI trainers back in. And so I think that the relationship actually continues. So I'm super excited about Humans in the Loop uh, and, uh, and I'm excited to, to stay in touch. Great, thank awesome. you, Brian. Me too. Um, if we have, any short feedback from Marissa or Adriel? Please, please share. I can, I can quickly uh, as I give a quick piece of feedback. Um, I think uh, Marissa brings up a good point. Um, I, I mean, I, I uh, as somebody who really cares about the, the the labor force out there, I think what you're doing and and the way you're uh, both providing value to the um, to the to the labor pool and and thinking about how to both educate and support them uh, financially is is great. The challenge for a lot of these AI companies is, is margins are slim as it is. And so thinking about how you differentiate yourself in a cost-effective manner is going to be um, probably the challenge here for a lot of companies, especially the, the earlier stage ones that are looking to implement some sort of AI. Um, so I'd, I'd really consider how, you, how can you uh, make yourself a, a strong enough value proposition to, um, for, for the cost of, for these uh, companies. Thank you, Adriel. Great feedback. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, Eva. We're going to move Marissa? right on to the next company. Marissa, did you have anything before we move on? Um, sure. So I would just add, um, you know, I think as you're building out the solution, thinking about career pathways for the workers would be really interesting. Uh, I think that would be another way to differentiate. And, you know, as they progress through being able to do higher level tasks, um, maybe they can also have like a path to a full-time job or something that's like more sustainable long-term. Thanks, Marissa. Thank you, Eva. Hey everyone, my name is Arvind. I'm a former product manager at Microsoft and ZocDoc, and now I'm building Keen. We help unlock knowledge within companies. There's a ton of learnings that happen on a daily basis within a company. You have product managers learning about feature requests from customers. You have CX learning about issues, bugs, you have sales learning why deals did or didn't close, a ton of other stuff as well. The problem is most of these learnings aren't occurring to the organization's intelligence. And this is because existing tools just aren't working well. Emails take too long to craft. Uh, content that you share on Slack, uh, it's not engaging. It often gets lost in the noise. And these problems are being exaggerated because of the shift to remote work. So we're building a tool that, that allows you to share engaging content in a quick way. Um, I mentioned a little bit about myself. My co-founder is my friend from ZocDoc, uh, an engineer at Spotify. So let's talk about the solution. Uh, imagine an app where you have a feed of quick video content from your coworkers where you can learn from them. You scroll through the feed and you get, uh, you, you can see content prioritized by importance and, and popularity. You can interact with that content, offer, offer suggestions, ask, uh, ask, ask feedback as well. Think of it like a TikTok for enterprise knowledge sharing. And of course you can share your own learnings as well. 
In terms of the model, we're thinking of, of a B to C to B play. Um, employees can start using the app, start engaging with their coworkers, and then once you have some bottom subtraction, uh, we'll start selling it to the enterprise, which will give them access to embed this content into more permanent knowledge bases and also search and curate this content. So it's kind of like the Dropbox or Slack model. Uh, so it's hard to predict the exact size of these markets, but one fun uh, fact that I noticed is last year, the entire global enterprise collaboration market was predicted to be 33 billion. And as of last night, Zoom itself is 42 billion. So these, uh, these markets are much bigger than most people imagine. Uh, in terms of our rollout plan, we want to start with tech startups where they're more comfortable with new modes of communication, and then roll out to remote companies, and then to all companies. And I just want to end with why now. Um, these two may be obvious, but there's been a spike in remote work, which has reduced those opportunities for passive learning. You no longer have those hallway conversations, those water cooler chats, and people are really looking for a way not just to learn from their coworkers, but also to connect with them. And then the other piece is people are more comfortable with video now more than ever uh, as, as, a, as a necessity. People have been forced to use video. And so I think this is a, the right time for uh, a new mode of communication and learning from, from your corporates through an engaging format like video. Thanks, Savi. That's on two minutes. Awesome job. Do we have any immediate questions from, I think we're going to kind of reverse the questions and start from the panel uh, as the audience questions roll in. Um, so Adrian, Brian, or Marissa, um, any any questions for Avi? Yeah, uh, super cool. Um, I, in, in terms of how you've, I, I understand how you recognize that the problem out there. Have you done any sort of customer discovery in terms of understanding if people would actually you know, use a product like this, or is it more of a of a thesis at this point? Uh, I've done a few discovery calls. Um, uh, in full transparency, this is a a concept that we've been exploring pivoting to this week. Um, so we haven't done a ton of research, but we've had some initial calls, and it seems to be resonating pretty well with people. Cool. Very timely. Right. Yeah. Marissa or Brian, uh, any questions from you? Uh, we have a question from the panel, uh, from the audience, it looks like. I did just see that, yes. Um, so we have one question come in from Mendy Yang. Will there be administrative controls around troll content that, pe that people upload? How will the quality control work? Yeah, it's a great also, question. Also, very um, timely. What's going on with Zoom today? Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. I think um, once we start selling to enterprise, we'll definitely need to have controls for HR for managers to come in and and flag content that that is inappropriate. Great, thank you. Uh, let's move right into feedback. I'd love to hear some feedback from on the business concept from the panel. Um, Marissa, if you wanted to, to start. So yeah, I mean, I think video is definitely an interesting concept. I haven't seen that done before. I'd be curious to see like what types of um, tasks and feedback it would work best for. I'm not sure in like all contexts it would be the best form versus like a you know sharing a recording of a PowerPoint or something like that. Um, so I think you know thinking about the best use cases and focusing on maybe like a couple to start or maybe like a particular vertical like just for product managers or just for salespeople and then like going out to um, you know other roles in the company long term um but yeah i mean i think it's, it's still early i would say definitely get lots of customer feedback and iterate you know based on what they're saying thanks marissa yeah just to just to echo that i i think the the other piece that to think about is there are obviously other other video solutions out there. So once you find that vertical where it's actually serving um, a strong pain point, and especially looking at a world where in the future we will be more distributed, we will be working remotely. I'm um, thinking about where can you develop beyond the video. So that's a good way to interact. But uh, within your product, how does that how does that evolve over time? Is there certain things that you can be able to be collecting or, or helping uh, improve collaboration? Um, and so thinking about you know the competitive advantage there rather than you know, competing with the Zoom or FaceTime or even a TikTok. Yeah, totally. Thanks, thanks Real. Any comments, Brian? Yeah, I I, I echo uh, I sort of echo what's been shared. I think that uh, you know we also run an ed tech practice and we've seen a lot around um, uh, sort of corporate education. Um, you know, I think the idea of enabling uh, employees to educate each other is great. I think that uh, there's some people that know things better than others do. So they're, they're, you know, for a smaller team, I think this can be uh, managed uh, relatively informally. Apologies if you hear meowing in the background. I have a very needy cat in here with me right now. Oh, please chill out. Um, uh, but so I think that, uh, 
as there are other companies in the space that like a deeper dive into competitive analysis will be important for a pitch like this. I'm getting targeted by Trainual uh, like every five minutes on Instagram myself personally. Um, and, uh, and, and I know there are other video platforms. I think, you know, one of the questions I have around this uh, is around sort of like discovery um, and, you know, an opportunity to actually be able to tie these videos to uh, sort of departments or process, specific processes that are run. You know, we have a we have like a really terrible Google Slides, uh, what we call our handbook at Venture Out that we use for for training. And what we've started doing is actually adding video in there because uh, it's so helpful. But usually it's like an annotated video, uh, sort of like a go to meeting recording or something like that, where it's the screen and people are walking through and showing things. So uh, I think for something like this to really have a sense of whether it's something that you feel like can work or not, you have to actually feel it. It's so user experience driven. And so I'm excited to see it once it gets live. I know that this like snackable content, snackable video content uh, is very much how uh, like the new generation is is uh, not only consuming like social content, but also educational content. And so uh, Thanks, you know, wanna see Thank more, you. very excited about it. Great feedback, thank you, Brian. Uh, Avi, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. Looking forward to, to chatting with you afterwards. Um, hi, I'm Bruce Ames. Um, LearnFlow, um, and thank you, uh, Faye, for uh, giving us a logo. LearnFlow is a B2B software and content platform that is presently a JV between an ed tech company and Northeastern University out of Boston that helps employees learn how to complete complex tasks using AI without requiring them to take linear and out of context academic courses. When I was an executive at Nielsen, um, the TV ratings company, we prided ourselves on having 600 of the best statisticians in the world. But now we live in a world where AI and machine learning is more important. Nielsen had only one choice, which was to send those statisticians to expensive linear classes in person or online taking time away from the tasks that had to be done by the company and at high expense to the company and loss of productivity for the employee. More than, sorry, more than $200 billion is spent by companies on education and tuition benefits. They have very little impact on their organization. Most employees don't use them and they take up valuable time. Dropout rates are very high as well. Our advantage at LearnFlow is we break up long form courses into their, into their pieces. We unbundle them for tasks. We integrate with an employer's existing productivity software such as Slack and Microsoft Teams. There's no need to leave the company's current system of communications or productivity. The platform itself has been battle tested with thousands of learners in Australia and Southeast Asia and it integrates with the, the best of the world-class university content from Northeastern with the tech capabilities of a startup. Northeastern is a unique university. We ourselves already have relationships That's one with, minute, 30, Bruce. 30. with more than 3,000 employees. We integrate with the platforms that are seen here, um, again, making it rather seamless. And the way that we've designed it so far is, um, I'm gonna just skip through this, is we're designing it with um with actual design partners with large employee bases so we're working with ibm microsoft cvs health last night we just had a meeting with salesforce all of them are interested in this kind of bite-sized chunked up piece of learning that automatically catches a learner in the midst of a task and provides thanks. them with the content and learning they need thank you awesome thanks bruce great job thank you one question from the panel, please. Uh, just fire away, there'll be one question taken from either Marissa, Adriel, or Brian. So whoever jumps in first. What do you, what do you, how do you think you fit into the competitive landscape um, in this more learning and development space or corporate learning? Well, I think the way that corporate learning and development is set up right now is either you're required to take a platform like Degreed or Coursera or one of the MOOCs, um, and it requires the employee to really go out outside the ecosystem of the employer, it either costs money, takes time, or is totally un irrelevant to the work that's being done. And so I think what's really neat about what we're doing is we've taken feedback from employers that say that employees generally don't like those platforms and don't use them very effectively. And instead, we've tried to weave the content that they would be taking exactly into the task that they would be doing. So for instance, if you were asked to 
create a machine learning algorithm for your employer and your employer was in ad tech, um, you know, you don't necessarily want to take the full Coursera course from Stanford University on machine learning. You just want to figure out how to write that particular algorithm. That's what our system does. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thanks, Adriel, for the question. We are, if, if anyone who's listening in in the audience would like to submit a question, please do so now. Um, while we're still waiting for those to come in, um, let's go into feedback from, from each of the panelists. Um, Brian, did you want to start? Unless, unless Marissa, unless you had a question. In terms of you know working with employers, how are you thinking about like customization and like how long does it take to you know build these courses for each company? So um, the modules are pretty standardized, as you would think academic content is fairly standardized. Standardized. So what we're doing is um, we can do a two-week sprint and come up with a module for a class that is totally like chunked out into its particular pieces. So um, that's the, the getting the content online. In terms of customization for a particular company, what's really interesting is the largest employers have a tremendous amount of their own content already. So IBM New Collar that we're working with right now or Salesforce Trailhead, they've got huge libraries of content. So really all we're doing is taking their content and either um, formatting in a way that it works for, you know, within Slack or Microsoft Teams, um, or we're linking out of the system so that at the appropriate time that the learner needs that content, they can access it. So it's a combination of academic content that we generate and translate and the actual employer's content. So that's where the customization comes in. Thank you, Bruce. Mm. Um, we have not received yet any questions from the audience. So. And I, and I just want to say one more thing before you uh, cut me off, which is that um, we're currently a JV of the university and an ed tech startup called Preptera. But our thinking is because we've gotten such a strong market feedback from some of the companies that we discussed that we're thinking of spinning this out and raising money, which is why we're here today. Did we have an ask in the last slide for raising? Um, or we, we did not have an ask for fundraising right now, but we are open to talking to venture capital about it or angels. Well, you've got two of them sitting right here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm going to let, let the, the panelists give their feedback. Now. <laughs> Yeah, a quick note on that. Um, uh, just make sure you go through the process before starting to fundraise uh, because it, it would just complicate things at the earlier stages. Definitely. What the purpose, it, obviously, COVID has uh, changed our trajectory a little bit, which is why we are just really within the last week or two thinking about a spin out, but absolutely well taken. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Bruce. Bruce. Yeah, really good presentation. I definitely like the space. I echo what Adriel is saying. I think that um, there are some universities that handle tech transfer really well, like Cornell Tech, and there's some that are really terrible about it. And so I think that, you know, to Adriel's point, the concern that a lot of investors will likely have is that if you, um, so I don't know that you have to actually have spun it out, but you have to know what the terms are going to be before you yep. go out and start the conversations, because I think there's just a lot of doubt if you don't know the terms that they're gonna be something that uh, will even uh, avail an opportunity for a, an, a venture investor or an institutional investor to get involved. Um, and so I think it's a really good point from, from Adriel. Um, totally makes sense. I like the idea, um, I like the concept of creating um, like very targeted education for highly technical topics. Um, in a snackable way. I think there's like very much a theme of like snackable content going on today. Um, but, uh, you know, most of the places that I would even envision to go and find answers to things like this uh, would either be someplace that I wouldn't necessarily trust, like Reddit or, uh, or like or other question platforms, or it would be something where I would feel like I had to dig through like a lot of curriculum in order to get to an answer. And so to, to have it, to have it be this sort of like, user-friendly and searchable but also like answers to highly technical questions i really like the space and i think that um you know the process of getting it spun out um you know and getting it uh you know and getting funds raised are really going to be to like prove the sort of next challenge that you have to take it to the next level thanks a lot brian thanks brian um marissa any comments from you on the business concept 
Sure. Um, well, I like the shout out to Cornell Tech uh, since I went there. So we um, love but, Cornell. They're good friends of ours. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, I think overall, I think it's a really interesting concept. I like the idea of like just in time learning. I think that's really important and something like our company struggles with and hasn't figured out yet. Um, I can definitely see it working well with big corporations that already have like big bodies of content developed, but I'm curious to see how you would also work with smaller businesses that probably don't have this content built out and could definitely use it. Um, so thinking about, you know, how you can scale that or maybe white label some content for, you know, other companies um, that they could benefit from as well. Um, I think also just on the employee engagement side, thinking about like how this is really differentiating um, from existing tools, how you can measure, you know, whether employees are learning faster and like the platform better uh, compared to, you know, their what they're currently doing on the training side. Um, just to show like ROI, especially for, you know, larger companies, uh, you know, what the cost savings is um, and, you know, how that can benefit the company long term. Wonderful. Thank Thanks, Melissa. Thank you so much, Bruce. It's a great job. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Kevon and I'm from Quarital and we collect survey data for market research companies. So face-to-face -face surveys are great, but they really suck because it's difficult to manage. It's 70% more expensive and it takes longer to get done. There haven't been much innovation in that space. So companies haven't been able to do much of the, the great work in terms of market research. So what we did is created a platform where they can log on, they can create their face-to-face -face interview projects by just selecting the number of respondents, how many questions are in their survey and the time of day. They're also able to select the locations where they want or train network of data collectors to go and do interviews with select uh, persons in any neighborhood. So they don't have to manage the network of people. We do that for them. Uh, they are able to see, the data collectors are able to see the jobs on our mobile app so they can see what jobs are available in their areas. Um, they're giving access to their location on their, their front and back camera. So we are using our AI to basically doing the work of a quality control officer, and that helps us in making sure that they can get the, the work that they need. So the companies get a live statistics board so they can see what's happening on the ground. And the market size for uh, this kind of industry is $28 billion, and we're targeting 10% of that. Uh, it's a B2B model, so it's 4,000 average order value. Uh, we made 42,000 last year and 12,000 in this quarter of this year. These are just some of our customers that we've worked with. And uh, this is our team. Um, so right now we're looking for connections with market research companies and B2B companies, as well as mentorships in uh, figuring some of the legal issues, operations and marketing. Uh, yeah, so that's Quartel. Thank you. One minute 50. I love love the time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kevin. <clears throat> um, Yelled it on okay. time there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, audience, please submit your questions uh, via the chat. And uh, Adriel and Marissa, please feel free to kick us off. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you're thinking about mitigating bias, given that you know people are getting paid to do these surveys. Right. So, right. So the persons who are getting paid are the persons who are interviewing persons to do the surveys. So that's how we're getting off of the issue of bias because they're going to the specific uh, neighborhood or, or they're going to a specific place in the public and they're selecting the persons to actually do the surveys. So that's one of the ways that we're getting out of the bias while maintaining a high response rate. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, any other questions from the panel? We'll, have, we'll, be, we'll take one more question from the panel or if any questions come in from the audience and then we'll move right into feedback. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so can you, the thing that I didn't follow in the presentation was the aspects of this that are driven by machine learning. So can you explain that for me, Kivan? Right. So in one of the difficulties in face-to-face -face, uh, surveys is the management of the people, making sure that they're actually collecting quality data. So in terms of how the data is checked, we're using the AI by the access of their location, their front and back camera and microphone. So we can verify that they're having a conversation with a real person. So we, we can verify that they're having a conversation with the target audience that we actually want them to speak with. 
So that's what we're using to manage the network of people, making sure that we have quality data. And that's less costly than, let's say, sending out someone to go with every team that you're sending out. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, let's move right I'll, into I'll feedback. Jump, yeah, I'll jump right into feedback there. Uh, and thanks for that answer. So I, I think the main, the main uh, comment I'll give you is, uh, is what I usually ask our panelists not to do, which is going to be a comment on the pitch as opposed to uh, specifically the core business. So Faye, you can yell at me when I'm... <laughs> Um, but I think it's an important one. And so I think that there are two primary uh, pitch styles uh, or like uh, ways to sort of message uh, the concept. And one is educational, as in it's a new space. You need to sort of educate your audience uh, on what it is that you're doing because it's new. And then for spaces that aren't new or maybe ones that are but still are highly competitive, it's very much a competitive positioning kind of pitch. I think that the idea of market research uh, and running polls and surveys online is one that's been around for a while. And so I think that you can very quickly get, you know, you can very quickly get the audience on board with the idea that this is needed and it's wanted and it's a very big market, probably with like one slide and then immediately go into differentiation because th those are the questions that I'm really left with is, is it cheaper? Is it faster? Is the AI really differentiated? Do the others do that or not? Because I'm not an expert in this space, you are. And so what it is, the, what is it? I care less about what it is like, learning about the market research process and why what you do is great and more about what's missing, what customers don't have, why the experience with respondents is bad and how this has made that so much better. Um, you know, the reason why we thought this was really interesting for this program is because the idea of creating fast iteration on product for companies, large or small, is critical, right? Like for, for startups, the number one thing that we find when the companies that go on to be successful are the ones that are able to listen and take feedback and then immediately pivot. And so platforms that enable companies to do that from their target market at like very quickly at scale is super compelling and I think really relevant to future of work. Um, but I think that like focus much more uh, like I'd probably focus 80% of this on how it's different, how the user experience is different for respondents and how it's different in terms of delivery uh, and, and, and experience for your customers. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Great comments. Uh, Marissa or Adriel, would either of you like to give some feedback on the business concept? <laughs> um, I, I, Brian, Brian said exactly what, I, what was on my mind and what I felt like uh, I needed a better understanding of is how you differentiate yourself. Marissa, what were your thoughts? Um, yeah, I would echo that as well. I think uh, I would also like to learn more about like how the data is analyzed post collection and you know how the people that are actually going on doing the interviews are vetted, um, like what makes them better, um, like higher quality to do those interviews, and just a little bit more about the value prop. That question from Mendy Yang, by the way, was how is the solution different from competing ones? And then specifically mentioned like expert networks like GLG, Gerson Lerman Group and GuidePoint. Mm -hmm. uh, Mendy, we should offline that. I spent like seven years working in the expert network space competing against German, Gerson uh, Lerman and would be happy to, to chat with you about that. I think the primary way that this is different is that those networks are networks of experts. And I think while Kayvon is building a, 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 a network of experts, it's more the actual survey process that their platform supports than being sort of like the network that gets mined, which is what those uh, GLG and those competitors like GuidePoint are like. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Great job. Great job. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Again, my name is Luis. Uh, this is Rudlo, a group of seasoning remote workers that are trying to bridge the gap between companies and the remote workforce. Uh, as all of you know, right now, remote work is a trend, but this has been on the way for almost 15 years. The estimation for this year was in the end, in the end of, for, for the end of this year was to have 80 million people working remotely. We are gonna check this number going so much higher for the current situation. Uh, we found an opportunity with this and it's to, to help companies to, to improve the efficiency and experience of these employees. As you know, a lot of these employees are getting isolated, lack of culture, and a lot of tour, tour, tour over. So the solution for this is Rudlo, uh, uh, enterprise social network where uh, companies could have access to a more friendly conversation with their remote workforce, access to directory, uh, to know where they are located around the world, to receive feeds to what is going on, where they are, 
And also we develop an algorithm that allow us to match employees and also in the B2C side allow uh, um, solo travelers or freelance to the, uh, basically what they are interested with, we match them and we create communities of like-minded people. Also with access to ecosystem like services, like accommodation, transportation, co-working space and everything that they need. Um, we are the only um, oh, solution in the market that bring, that bring all these uh, tools together in the same place. It's not a, our expectation to compete against them. We see all of them as a possible uh, partnership of us. Um, our revenue model is premium mark memberships, enterprise memberships, and um, adver target advertising on the B2C side. Um, uh, last year, we got selected as an accelerator program here in Colorado Springs. Now we are doing the piloting with B2B clients. And uh, this is our team. We do what we sell. We are all remotely uh, around the world. And we are looking for 150,000 for, for, for our seed round and also for corporate connections to do a pilot of our, of, of our road. Thank Thanks you for your lot. time. Excellent. Thanks a lot. That's right on two minutes. Okay, great. Um, we, I'd love to ask the panel if they have any questions for Lewis. Yeah, uh, Luis, I was a little bit confused whether this is a, a solution for uh, a communication tool for, for enterprises and their remote workers or for uh, remote workers as more of a social network to get connected to, to other remote workers and, and to the communities they're in. Great question. Uh, both. Uh, our target is B2C and B2B. Our, first, our principal objective is help the companies. So we have a more friendly communication between managers and remote workforce. But additionally, that remote workforce have an access to an ecosystem through our technology. So that ecosystem also join B2C market and our, our algorithm match these people depending on their interest, which people is like-minded with. So we want to attack both sides. Our first step will be corporation, yes or yes, right now. But uh, we believe that the B2C side will be the one that help us to build content and to keep the people interested in that social network. Thank you. Okay, we don't have any other questions from the audience. We'll take one more question from the panel before feedback. Can you talk more about your business model and you know how you see that scaling long term? Yeah, perfect. Um, we started uh, as a business model with B2C. We actually ran a beta testing last year with 600 people. After that, we meet with a lot of companies. So we discovered that the companies are the way to scale faster and to generate a better impact. So the business model is free premium membership for the B2C side, member, uh, membership for the companies, and other uh, target advertising for everybody that is on the platform. What I mean with target advertising is to bring that uh, services that offer services to these remote workers, whatever they are, could be accommodation, transportation, co-working, and advertise them their products. So in the same place, in the same platform, remote workers can talk with their bosses, be connected with the company. We, I, I didn't have the time to explain all the features, but we have notification for the boss. We have, we have a lot of push and notification that will keep together the boss with the remote worker, but also the remote worker will have, will have access to an ecosystem, whatever they are. So that ecosystem is the one that we plan to advertise in our platform. Thank you, Lewis. <clears throat> um, so we do have one question that's came in from the audience. Um, Brian, would you like to do the question from the audience or should, would you prefer that we go straight into the feedback? Let me know. Go right, go right to the question. I, uh, I'm, I'm a fan, I think, uh, you know, especially for time, I think the panel pretty much covered it. So, uh, you know, great pitch and I've got nothing up to add. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. Uh, so we will offline that question, um, and Mendy directly with Lewis. Uh, thank you. And we'll move right into the next startup from here. Thanks so much, Lewis. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so I am Laurent, the CEO from uh, Swissboard. Um, the idea was really to create something which is really disruptive in terms of, um, of idea, um, to make real certifying skills passport something which is objective, not only for companies, because there is a lot of skills passport ongoing in companies, but especially also for individuals, for employees. 
Um, so, as you know, digital transformation is breaking everything, it's changing everything, employees' expectations have totally changed. And this leads to a real impact in terms of loss of gain in companies that are estimated by experts to $45,000 per year and per employee. Uh, by 2022, we know that more than half of all employees will need reskilling and upskilling, but in parallel, CVs are dying. There are too many false information. We are working in companies in semantic, in uh, artificial intelligence, on false data. And current enterprise HR solutions are not suitable anymore. Why? Because they are, they are not employee-centric. They are company-centric. So how to change? The idea is to build an engaging win-win model with employee and improve decision-making with objective skills data. So this I said, um, so unique value proposal, it's uh, basically a uh, solution contains a uh, real uh, innovative talent and learning management solution behind that is enhancing collective intelligence. So assessing, evaluating, capturing all skills data, putting on top some That's one minute, Freddy. Yeah, that are managed by um, that are managed by our artificial intelligence to deliver certifying CIS passport and accurate HR analytics to companies. So here are some few of you. Our business model is premium model. And going to the current situation, so here's a team. Uh, we have not raised any money up to, up to now, uh, but we have achieved already one strategic customer, which is post office in France. We have four large international projects ongoing. One, one of them is really actual because it's uh, touching the That's nursing. Two minutes. If you want to wrap it up, but well, we're at two yeah. minutes now. Yeah, I will just finish so because this project is pretty important. So we are really fighting today to get skills of nurses recognized. Nurses are doing extra job in this period. And um, so we are working with European Federation to find a way to recognize their skills. So we are engaging in a really large project, being small. And that's why also in the near future, we need to be more structured. We need help. We need help to scale and make this passport available for everybody. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Laurent. Let's go straight into questions from the, from the panel. Um, Adriel or Marissa, we'll start with either of you. I had a question about <laughs> the kind of value prop of the product. It seems like it's a knowledge capture product for employers, but I guess I'd like to hear more about like why this product is differentiated from other tools. And like, it seems like it's more of a value prop for the employers, but potentially also for the employees too. Okay, uh, that's a really good question. We are not generating or we are not a knowledge product. So to be uh, fully clear, so we are bringing the way to capture all information around people knowledge. Let's imagine, for instance, now we are speaking a lot about remote work. People are engaged in projects asynchronously and they are not able to see their manager. They are not able to see their teammates. How do you give feedback about the competencies, the practical competencies that people have developed? And all those information somehow are lost and the people are not getting recognized. And then you are speaking about coach, manager coach, that needs to take decision to help the employee to develop themselves based on which data, based on which information. And this is this that in companies today, there is a lot of data around skills that exist in companies. And we want to help them to capture it in a better manner give them back as ownership to the employee so that the employee can better plan his future and better project himself with the help of his manager. So this is the, the intent of the solution. It's like a bit of a passport where you have your stamps and you get your stamps for your skills and it's a much more advanced stuff, but it's kind of like a medical book. You get your information about your health, you get your information about your skills, and you take it with you during your uh, entire career, entire working life. Thank you, Laurent. Do we have any other questions um, from the panel before we move into some short feedback for Laurent? Uh, no questions, but I can give uh, some feedback here. Um, hey. Given this idea of the passport um, and the freemium model, it'd be really helpful to, to demonstrate that there is adoption at the, at the employee level Obviously, the, you know, uh, showing sales cycles and, and generating revenue from employers is going to take a little bit longer. But if you are able to show the, uh, mass adoption across employees, then it will also help you uh, develop your, your adoption with employers. Um, so within, 
that's a so huge point. Let him. Let him. Let him. Yeah. And this is today. So we have made the first study, the first survey uh, uh, on adoption on existing customers and also on employees that are not today part of Skills Board. And 72% of employees mentioned that this makes sense for them. They would be able to better project themselves, be better in their job, um, be better recognized for them. It's really critical. And um, we were really happy to have this because 72% cross-generational, uh, it's uh, for me a really, uh, a really good result. So our employees, so using the passport, are becoming our ambassador inside the company and then when they are leaving outside the company. Thank you. Any comments from Brian? Yes. Um, so, Laurent, you and I got a chance to speak yesterday. Um, I think that Adriel's question speaks to some of what we talked about in terms of clarity on, uh, you know, it's almost like a marketplace where you're sort of serving employees and employers. And I think clarity around that's going to be really clear. Um, and, you know, given that you're uh, attacking two different audiences, you have the same challenge that marketplaces have in terms of like needing to have, uh, you know, sort of critical mass and engagement from both sides. It's obviously different than a marketplace, but I think similar in some ways. Um, and so speaking to those challenges and uh, like specifically how you're going to be able to sort of get the engagement from both, I think is critical. But as you and I talked about um, and something that uh, was discussed earlier with one of the other companies, the idea of empowering managers to be better coaches to be better teachers to be better leaders i think is uh is really critical today i think one of the biggest challenges that employers have is um that the like average tenure of a millennial employee is less than one year and um you will see that may change in this environment <laughs> because i feel like people are really really putting a premium on job security and and uh uh you know in the midst of everything going on um but uh, you know, creating better engagement between a manager and their employee is critical to that. They say the most important thing to the quality of work life for an employee is the manager directly above them and the relationship they have with them and the quality of that person as a manager. So, uh, you know, I'm excited about uh, that piece of this. Um, and if you can really start to drive that forward and show metrics on it, I think it'll, uh, it'll really go a long way to selling towards uh, both the employers, but also I would be excited if there was a tool that made me better. We talked about this. I need to be better at managing my team. You are welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. We'll be a Thank customer. You, Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Marissa Adriel. Hey, everyone. Matt Strauss, co-founder and CEO of Solve. Uh, we're being called the future of work in cities, and we're a software network to help the uh, hourly and underserved job seeker find jobs, training programs, and supportive services in one place. So what we're learning is employers are spending about $1,000 to $7,000 for entry-level hires. Schools and training providers spend about 15 to 20% of their time tracking down their participants and students towards getting their first job. So on a citywide level, we're having challenges finding or retaining job candidates for either job training programs or for actual jobs. We're having trouble tracking and vetting job candidates as every program and training model is different. And then on a large citywide initiative or government contract, we have trouble reporting local and diverse hiring initiatives, either for uh, real estate or government contracts. So the reason why this is happening is it's really hard for our uh, underserved or overlooked job seeker, hourly job seeker, to overcome all the barriers to employment. It's a very fragmented solution. The bigger the city gets, the harder the problem is. So yeah, we simply built a pathway towards employment by addressing Payton's barriers to employment as well as a resume builder, uh, finding tra training programs, supportive services, and jobs all in one place. Uh, we have actually a network effect solution because everyone's adding job candidates uh, to solve. It's a large market opportunity. Nonprofits are actually paying more money at, than employers are right now, but as our network grows, the believe the inverse will happen. Um, as we load the next slide here, uh, we have a talented team. Um, we have two exits on our, on our team. It's not loading. Uh, two exits, and uh, one was a $100 million exit to Twitter. There he is, uh, uh, Samir. And then we also have one IPO, uh, Dario. Next slide here. I can't memorize it anymore. I just switched it up. Uh, yeah, we have a proven That's model. We have revenue already, and uh, we have large customers. We're actually just launching Atlanta for COVID response. Dallas will be next week. And then um, we already have investors. Is that, is that time? Sorry. 
Sorry, we're nearly out of time. I'll let, I will let you just sort of finish there, but it's you still do have control, but if you want to just click back into the webinar, it doesn't look like you're in it. There we go. Yeah, so we, have, we, already, uh, we already have investors I'll committed. Let you right Investors committed for this round, um, and we're still raising. We lowered our burn just in case, but uh, we do have a couple of uh, large checks that are close to writing. Um, and last but not least, as we're called the future of cities because of this last screen, I will let it sit on here. Um, this is the revenue potential based on our new markets. But yeah, this is uh, basically the future of cities. So mayors will be able to log in and see real time data of their cities. So of what's the biggest barriers to employment, the most productive training programs and staff members. Uh, there's subcontractors and vendors who's hiring the most folks along the way. So it becomes a, a tool that actually uses for potential legislation or unemployment benefits, you know, as time goes on. Um, yeah, I'm Matt Strauss, co-founder, CEO of uh, Solve, and thanks for listening in. Thank you, Matt. Any questions from our panel, please? You can either fire away or I'll, I'll ask directly. <laughs> Marissa? How are you seeing, um, how are you seeing this? platform being impacted by COVID? Like, are you seeing an uptick in job availability and like job matching or, you know, how do you see that both now and like post pandemic? Yeah, so of course there's less jobs right now. There's a lot of employers on a hiring freeze except for like the warehouse jobs, logistics and grocery store jobs. Um, so there's a huge you know, increase of supply there. The risk of, uh, like, we serve a lot of underserved job seekers. So people coming out of prison, uh, city college students, um, a lot of folks have many barriers or at least one barrier to employment. So besides, besides jobs on solve, we also have training, but we also have supportive services through APIs, so like food and so forth. So solve becomes like a communication tool to help those candidates have a one-stop solution to figure out where to go. So yeah, it's it's a, there's been definitely an increase of need, <laughs> hence why we launch in new markets. And the nonprofits or government systems actually use us as their like their communication CRM tool while they invite all their employer and other nonprofit partners, and then we do revenue shares with them. So we all can monetize and grow along the way. Um, yeah, there's definitely an increase Thanks. in demand. Thanks, Matt. Uh, any questions from you, Adriel? We don't have anything that's come in yet from the audience. How do you think of your, your customer here? Uh, as you're, It sounds like you're working with three kind of parties, uh, the employer, the, the governments, and, and um, the uh, the work the, the work pool. So how do you think about uh, acquisition on both sides? Yeah, so I think the, the exciting part. So we've proven that when we get one new uh, customer or even a free user, they'll often invite between five to 10 other staff users of the nonprofit and then often one or two employers. So we leverage existing relationships and we bring it on to software. So they send mass emails of job openings or program openings. We basically bring it all in one place. So uh, long story is there's a free access to come on, solve, post a job, post a program for free. Um, and then they can upgrade it to, to one posting that's self-service. And then there's extra things that we do after that. So our ranges of pricing for employers go from 250 a month to about 4,000 a month. And then the, for the uh, nonprofits, it's 250 a month to about um, 3,000 a month. We have one nonprofit, $70,000 a year is their contract. It's a multi-city contract that's to five ventures. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, I do have one question I'm going to ask from from the audience, and then we'll go into uh, some feedback a little bit. I know there was a bit of feedback given there, but uh, where does Upwork fit into your competitive landscape if you've come across them in the space? Yeah, so um, Upwork could actually be, be we're building APIs now, so they're building APIs in the job feeds. Um, so our competitors actually end up becoming API. We're, we're basically a, a one-stop shop to help the people that were left behind. And uh, it really, what we need to do is bring as much information to them as possible. Upwork truly isn't the best tool for a lot of this population though. Um, it's a little bit too high of skills, um, unfortunately. So we actually focus more on the construction of jobs, uh, uh, hourly jobs first to help people get back on their feet and then upskill from there. But uh, yeah, in summary, all the job boards that are out there are truly integration partners. One of our investors is from LinkedIn. So LinkedIn has been and a request to do an API with them. So if you update your profile on LinkedIn, we'll update on Solve as time goes on, then help the nonprofits and government and cities um, measure like the five-year impact of a person. Because most likely if they get out of the white collar job market, they'll keep their LinkedIn profile today a little bit more versus us being like their starter profile. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, Brian, did you want to give any, any feedback or questions there? We are running a little over. Oh, wait, let's just make sure yeah, I meet. I'll, I'll be super quick. Um, I think that this couldn't be more timely today. I think that the 
uh, like you're, this is very much, I think a social impact play, like you're, you're a, you're a for-profit business, but this is very much something that has a social impact. And I think that the, the community that you're focusing on is one that's rapidly growing in the midst of the crisis that we're all in today. Um, I got, um, so like, I would like to understand a little bit more about like what kind of, uh, uh, critical mass you have to have in a specific geography in order to then become relevant as uh, like a future of work analytics platform for governments and cities to make those kinds of decisions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, and I, I think I'd share that in the pitch because it sounds like a pipe dream uh, unless you can show that you can actually be relevant at a minimum level of penetration um or that you just really clearly know the path and this is just like a phase three or four kind of a thing um but other than that um you know i think it's hard to say in a two minute pitch to add more stuff in but given how focused on like ux this is to be able to get that lower skill worker to be able to engage really well with it i think i'd probably touch a little bit on how it is that you're simplifying things and making it really uh, sort of plug and play for people. But other than that, great work. I think 20K MRR to raise 750 is like right on the button with the market. And so I don't see you, if you can get in front of the right people having trouble raising um, and look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Thank you Matt. Great job. Uh, my name is Rahir Rahman. I'm the founder and CEO of Turn. Increasingly, the world's largest companies are relying heavily on 1099 workers to complete critical tasks, yet the process of sourcing, screening, and retaining these workers has been a mess. At Turn, we want to help address that. In the last 15 months, we've already supported over 100 enterprise companies in 30 industries and managing their identities and data for 75,000 1099 contractors. Coming into the source problem, right? Employers are wasting billions of dollars trying to find these people. It's really expensive and there's no way to filter the signal from the noise. Today, if you talk to the HR teams, they're using a multitude of acquisition channels to find them. All they really get is intent. A worker wants to work in one place, but they have no idea of distinguishing characteristics of what would make one person better than the other. So what we wanna do is radically change the way companies do this by bringing in intent, identity, and experience so you can target them the signal from the noise. We do this through a ladder up strategy of three products, identity, data sharing, and worker sourcing. All three are live in market today. Our identity product was built from the ground up specifically for the 1099 space. It's better, cheaper, faster. Data sharing allows us to combine identity and performance data to have unique insights into worker behavior. We make this now available through a worker sourcing tool, allows employers to target specific workers they want. Some metrics, we're counter-cyclical. Over the last 15 months, we're now at a million revenue run rate. We've grown five times year over year. Our two biggest verticals are healthcare and delivery. Obviously, both are very important during this pandemic and are growing. We have an experienced team, four startups built, two exits, one pending. We've collectively raised over 50 million of capital to date. Today, we are raising a two million bridge round to help us meet the market demand and bridge us to our Series A. Thanks so much. Thank you. Excellent. Right under two minutes. Great presentation. Thanks, Raya. Thank you. Nailed it. Uh, let's start with our panelists for questions. Marissa? Great. Um, I would love to hear more about how you're retaining the workers and anything around like employee like benefits, like healthcare that you're providing. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. You know, we, we believe in a ladder up strategy. So when we knew it from the beginning, we said there's an iterative product suite in order to be able to do this. What most labor marketplaces do is they raise tons of money from venture capitalists and they go out and market to workers. And that costs a lot of money. In our industry, if we tried to do that, we would be butting up against you know, everyone from Grubhub to Instacart to Uber to try to get the same attention of those workers. Instead, what we decided to do is develop a product that matters a lot to our industry. The identity screening tool is our, kind of our Trojan horse create a better product that's suited for the 1099 world, do a B2B relationship that sells into the channels themselves, and then as a result of the cost savings, enter into the data partnerships that allow us to co-own that data and the worker's information through permissions and consent. So we don't compete with our workers, we aggregate all of them. So companies like Spin, Wings, Rinse, Saucy, all of their workers are now part of our database. So think of it this way, it's a collaborative labor marketplace. Everyone is contributing. 
So today we have 75,000 in our database. Wings just entered into a partnership with us. They're bringing 30,000 of their drivers nationwide. So we're now 100,000 workers. We manage that through kind of, you know, a relationship through B2B. We don't go out and get workers for the marketplace. It all comes to us from our ecosystem. And so the goal is to be able to create scale without spending a single dollar of marketing. We haven't spent a single dollar in 15 months in marketing to create that scale. Excellent, thank you. You know what, I'll ask a question since we don't have any from the audience. Um, can you, uh, right here, can you talk uh, about the uh, identity piece and the background check piece? I know how critical that is. Um, and so I'd love to hear about that as sort of a feature, but also how uh, to know how critical that is to the enterprises that you've worked with so far um, yeah. in bringing on the, the type of labor that you've got on the platform. Well, I think, you know, both historically and today, uh, identity is a massively important part. It's the gatekeeper for employment into the space. And, uh, and the reason because of that is because, you know, it's called trust and safety for a reason. The people that are delivering your food, your car you're jumping into to ride, it matters who these people are. And so from that perspective, making sure an identity product works is really important. But the profiles of the, you know, the employer's needs, I should say, sorry, in the 1099 world are very different than the W-2 world. When you guys are all hired in your jobs, it doesn't matter if a background check takes, you know, instant or four days because you're gonna be hired at a long protracted hiring cycle. In the 1099 world, most of the time, the hiring happens really quickly. Someone expresses an interest in a job, you want them working as fast as possible and you want the checks to be done. So when we went to the drawing board, speed and price were two really important qualities that were important to us when we were building because that's what mattered to our employers. Employers said, we bulk hire, we need this to be a lot cheaper because people, the retention is not what it is in W2. And second, we need it to be fast so we can captivate, cap to capture them while their attention is there. And so you know, when we built this from the ground up, those are the things we solve for. And it's reflected in kind of the way the adoption curve we've seen from enterprises as well, saying this is a product that's better suited for us, it's better priced for us, and we're willing to do certain things in, in order to have this, such as share our data with our workers, improve the ecosystem overall, so that collaboratively we win versus competitively. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. Thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate great. it. Cool. Yeah, Rahir, thanks so much. I think like masterclass and how to pitch the deck is great. I tried to give you feedback yesterday, but there really wasn't much to critique on. So thank you. Really appreciate good job. It. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I'm uh, Ranu, founder, CEO of Wisconsin. Wisconsin is basically an Amazon for micro white collar services. So uh, let's uh, jump into the problem. So this is RG Enterprises, a small business uh, looking for e-commerce website, tax registration, and trademark filing. Now it would search within, it, within its network on Google and online directories, explain requirement over email and call, get codes, compare and negotiate, and finally hire without confidence. Now this leads to procuring of white collar microservices being 7x more expensive, consuming 10x more time, a lot of payment and delivery conflicts, and finally lacks trust and assurance. Now this in India happens with 35 million SMEs currently, 2 million SMEs coming up each year. Average annual spend per SME is about $200, making TAM, making TAM in 2026 to about $48 billion. Uh, Really yeah. Can't... So if we, yeah. So if we capture 10% at take rate of 20%, then the venue would be about thousand million dollars. Let's change how services are booked using Wisc Council. On Wisc Council, you can book more than 100 service gigs at 7x affordable prices, 10x more faster, four clicks to book a service, expert assigned within minutes, pay in installments, track work delivery, and you get 100% with assurance. That means you get your money back if service is not delivered. Stories of far, so we have about $3,000 monthly sales repeat rate, 30% repeat users, and 1,000 verified experts out of 3,000 signups. Pandemic has not been a crisis for us. Past four weeks, we have seen about 5x more growth. SMBs love to book services, maintain business continuity from home, and a wider market acceptance post-pandemic. 
So me and Royce are co-founders. We have freelance for over six years now in designing and web development. He's a tier one computer science grad, full stack coder. We are looking to raise about $400,000, build a team and spend on marketing and branding. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Runner. Great job. Adriel, let's go right into any question or any or any feedback that you've got. I know you've got a hop. Yeah, I, I think the as far as the as far as feedback goes, um, I think it's helpful to kind of understand who you're you, when you think about your target customers, where you understand for the market size wise, how you break that down in terms of your initial focus and um, how you think about that over time. OK, so uh, I think uh, target market wise, we are actually targeting very local and micro businesses in India. If you see about uh, out of 60 million SMEs in India, 80 percent are yet uh, are still offline. Now, these SMEs operate in tier two and tier three towns and are wanting to go from offline to online. These SMEs are very native. They want everything in their own language. So technically, we are now targeting these SMEs to go to help them go offline to online and uh, procure services from our platform. Awesome. Marissa. Um, hit me. Sure. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about how you are onboarding the service providers onto the platform, how you're vetting them. And like, it seems like you have to build the two sided marketplace and love to hear on the service provider side, how you're doing that. Uh, so basically, I mean, uh, right now we are not spending anything uh, for, uh, from the perspective of enrolling the supply side. So it's been all organic, uh, but our uh, average approval cycle is of like two to three weeks. So what experts have to do is they have to complete a very comprehensive profile. Then we set up an interview. Uh, we have a questionnaire in place that they have to fill up. They have to go through an extensive training. So we have standard operating procedure in which they have to operate on the platform to keep the experience very standard and quality driven. So once all of this is completed, then we approve somebody to provide service on the platform. Right. Thank you. Any comments, Brian? Uh, we've got nothing coming in from the audience. So sorry, Marissa, why don't you uh, did you want to wrap up? I know that you got a, a question in there. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't know as much about the Indian market, but I would say like thinking about how you plan to scale this, you know, beyond that market to the US and globally um, would love to hear more about that. Um, I think that it's definitely a needed service, it sounds like, which is great. Um, but I do think there's probably a lot of challenges to getting all of these small businesses on the platform. So like word of mouth and like marketing at scale could be a challenge for your growth. Um, so just thinking about like the best ways to do that. Thanks, Marissa. Yeah, and I think that's that's uh, it's a good point uh, about uh, you know when you're pitching to an American audience. I think uh, like maybe a bit of education on sort of how things work there versus uh, how it works here um, to give a sense more of sort of how you fit into the marketplace there. Um, I'll tell you after having gone through this with you yesterday, I think you made a lot of really significant changes and uh, significantly improved the pitch. Um, and again, I think there was very much a theme uh, in the program uh, today with the companies that we had uh, around uh, sort of workforce support uh, and virtual worker support. And I think it's uh, it's never been more important than it is today. Um, and just a lot of a lot of important challenges being solved by by yourself and by uh, the other companies that we have in this space. So great job on the pitch today, and thanks so much for participating. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, great job.